Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Bill Roach and this is episode four in the footnotes on Plato approach. We're gonna go from Spinoza to Hume. Now, as we're looking at this, a few things that I want us to consider is, is that, you know, when we're reading literature or we're studying art or today when we watch movies, we evaluate people and situations and people try to discuss different issues related to them but in reality, all of these situations boil down to some pertinent issue within the history of philosophy, whether it be in ethics or metaphysics or epistemology or any of these other variant topics. Now, something that's of interest today is that when philosophy is taught in many modern circles, they try to find contemporary examples. And there's nothing wrong with that, but in doing so, sometimes they're not actually raising the question in its best form. So sometimes when people discuss an issue, you can discuss it at various levels. You can have an intro level, an intermediate, and an advanced level. And the reality is, is that today's society discusses things on a very surface level. And sometimes our historic literature does it at an intermediate level, but philosophy tends to discuss it at its advanced level. It discusses the issue as such. And when you start to turn to modern philosophy and the issues that modern philosophy presents, you see it worked out in every different sphere of society. And that's because, as we've said, ideas not only have consequences, but they have origins too. So by studying in its highest form, you can deal with it in all of its lower forms. Now, you may have to clarify it and clean it up a little bit, but the point is, is that we're trying to take a footnotes approach so that you can understand the big issues of the highest issues. And notice we're not going into incredible detail with it. We're not trying to deal with every nuance. I'm trying to give you something that's just straight to the point. So with that, we're just going to switch to our evaluation and we're going to discuss this issue of from Spinoza to Hume. And we've been using this entire approach by looking at Alfred North Whitehead's quote that says, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes on Plato or to Plato. And we know what the purpose of a footnote is. It's to clarify something. It's to say, I may differ at this point or I add to it at this point. And that's what all of the history of philosophy has been so far. And we've discussed various ways of the history of philosophy. And we've used this chart by Dr. Norman Geisler, which is really just a summary of the history of philosophy. And we know that there is rationalism and empiricism. They're the two dominant philosophies that bring us up into the modern era. And today we're going to look at the end of modern philosophy. And specifically, we're going to finish with Hume. But by way of just reminder, rationalism says knowledge comes before experience. Empiricists are arguing that knowledge comes from the sense experience. And the harder forms of empiricism say, if we're going to be an empiricist, we only have sense knowledge. There's no abstraction like there is in Aristotle. There's no world of forms. We're literally left with the senses and what can be drawn from the senses. And what we're going to do is we're going to finish this section and then we're going to transition into Kant the next time and looking at positivism and idealism as the, the flow going in and out of these key figures. So the first thing that we're going to look at is pantheism by Spinoza. So Spinoza was a Dutch Portuguese 17th century Jewish philosopher. And now what's of interest with this is that at the very title, we say that Spinoza was a pantheist. And for us to understand that, we have to understand the idea of theism comes from the Greek word theos and pan from the word all. So the notion is, is that it's all is God and God is all. So the tree is God and you are God and the dog is God and everything is God. Now that can come in varying degrees, but the point is, is that all is divine. But what the interesting point is, is that Spinoza was not only a pantheist, but he considered himself a Jewish philosopher. And Jews, by definition, are not pantheists. They believe in a doctrine of creation, where you have the creator that is divine and the creation that is not divine. So in many respects, he may have considered himself a Jewish philosopher, but he was detracting from historic 
Judaism as found in the Old Testament. And he was also a Dutch Portuguese individual from the 17th century. Now, what we have to see is, is that Spinoza grants Descartes' new mathematical scientific method, but he changes it for his own ends. And as we discussed in a previous episode, Descartes redefined what we mean by reason. Reason wasn't something that was overarching, something of the forms like Plato had. Rather, it was one of the lower tiers in, in Plato's whole sphere of epistemology. Descartes was arguing that reason can only be about mathematical and scientific things. And Spinoza, like many modern philosophers, just grant that's the proper definition of reason. So in that sense, he's a detraction thesis from Plato, but he's also a continuity thesis with modern philosophy. Now, Plato and Descartes held that there were two levels of reality. Spinoza taught that there was one level of reality. He claimed that God and nature are a single substance, but viewed from two different angles. Namely, Spinoza was a pantheist. So remember, within Plato, you had the material world and you had an immaterial world. And he made that in such a way as to understand how the forms operate and what they are in and of themselves versus how material things are and how they operate in and of themselves. But what Spinoza tried to do was to wipe out this distinction. Like we said, there aren't two different kinds of substances. There aren't two different levels of reality. There's one level of reality, and all of that reality is divine. And that's because he's claiming that God and nature are a single substance. So that's another detraction thesis from Plato, but it's also an issue where he's transitioning into giving a fully orbed understanding of reality by claiming it's all divine. In addition, what we have to find is that materialists deny there's a creator. And that's because they claim that all of matter is sort of eternal in some sense. You know, they'll deny an eternal God, but they'll affirm an eternal world or an eternal creation. Pantheists differ from traditional creationists and from materialists because they deny the reality of a creation. It's not just that the world has always been here, it's that the world's always been here because the world is divine. And that's a radical difference for what a Jewish philosopher, at least one would suspect from a Jewish philosopher, because Judaism rightly taught a doctrine of creation. So he's a detraction from really that religious background. Now, a footnote on footnotes, it's interesting that there's not just one form of Judaism. Just like you have liberal Christianity, which really is not a form of Christianity at all, as Machen was right when it's Christianity or liberalism, it's not a form of Christianity because it radically denies the key tenets of the idea of God and divine revelation. Well, that can be worked out into all of these other major world religions, but specifically within Judaism. You've got a whole sphere from liberal Judaism to very conservative Judaism. And by him denying creation and being a pantheist, he's definitely removed himself from any strong, orthodox, historic, biblical understanding of who God is and what man and creation is according to historic Judaism. So what we have to see is, is that Plato does not teach a doctrine of creation, but he does grant there are two worlds, a world of ideas and a world of temporal things. And in this, creation is a distinctly Judeo-Christian concept. So as we've discussed in the previous lecture, in certain respects, Plato is right. There is a difference in the material versus the immaterial world and how they function and operate, but it took Christians of the middle ages and really the judeo-christian worldview which you know the old testament is really the precursor of the new testament to give us this historic and distinctly judeo-christian concept of the doctrine of creation creation ex nihilo creation from nothing which was a key tenet that spinoza was trying to deny now we could get into many other features with spinoza but the key point to understand is that spinoza was an extreme pantheist in the eyes of these modern materialists. Modern materialists were not pantheists. They were, well, in many respects, 
denying that there was anything divine. Now, we move on to really the antithesis of Spinoza, which is found in Hobbes. Hobbes was a 17th century English philosopher. And for him, nothing exists except matter, and all that exists is matter. So we see the key distinction between Spinoza. Spinoza would have said, you know, all that exists is divine, and that which is divine is all that exists. There's one single substance. Now, Hobbes is agreeing that there is a single substance, but it's not a divine substance. It's a material substance. And what we find is, is that with Spinoza, he departs from Plato because he's giving up the two substance view of reality, the material and the immaterial. Hobbes is also doing it in a totally different wheel. That spoke is departing, but it's still a departure because he's denying the spiritual aspect, the immaterial aspect of the world. In fact, he's denying the notion of forms altogether because there's nothing but matter and all that exists is matter. So for him, all material things are considered to be selfish and competitive. They're always striving and fighting for power. So how does Hobbes work out his philosophy, this materialism? Well, it's rightly for him applied to ethics. So he's looking at when you see people and you see material things, they're striving for power and dominance. So for Hobbes, because man is essentially material, he's essentially competitive. He's com and competitive with one another, competitive over the natural world, which is just another manifestation of material things. Also, because for him, the natural state of man is to be brutish and nasty to one another, only an absolute monarchy, namely the Leviathan, which is the great beast and what Plato called tyranny, can force man to act justly, which is contrary to his nature. So, we see another departure from Hobbes. To be just is not to fulfill human nature. For him, the natural state of man, which is not an ontological or an essential or a metaphysical claim in the, in the platonic sense of the term, even though it is a metaphysic, it's a materialistic metaphysic, for him, we're naturally brutish or nasty, mean, always doing things to create dominant competitive powers over one another. So how do you control a group of people like that? Well, for him, you have an absolute monarchy. And that's what the whole point of the book Leviathan was about. And this is what Plato would have called a form of tyranny, but this is what he would have called proper government. But in addition, for him, God and the soul, he would say, or the concept of God and the concept of the soul and are just forms of of a material body. For him, heaven is considered an ideological, political stability, and reason is a salve unto the senses. So for him, when we talk about God, and we talk about the soul, and we talk about heaven, they're nothing more than ways of trying to bind the minds of the material masses to do what they need to do in order to fulfill this absolute monarchy, the Leviathan in itself. But also, in this sense, it's reason is not just something that is giving us knowledge of the forms. It's a slave to the senses. It's purely passive. There's nothing more to it than a receptive capability and capacitor in that which it is trying to do. Now, just by way of keeping up with what we're doing here in order to truly keep it as a footnotes approach, we move on to another influential philosopher. This time, it's a person who's considered a Christian philosopher, and it's Blaise Pascal. And he argued, in light of this modern-day view of reason, that faith was a wager. He's trying to try to interact in the modern Descartes mathematical scientific understanding of reason, and he's trying to make room for faith. So Pascal was a 17th century French philosopher and theologian, and his pen says are probably some of the most influential writings from his time period. In fact, one key author from today wrote a commentary on the pen says, and he said it's been one of his best selling books. And it's because when you start to restrict the nature of humanity down to material concepts and mathematical calculations, we forget the fact that we're real persons with emotions 
and strivings beyond these material mathematical concepts. And that's why his book, which was striving to overcome that, was so influential. It was tugging on the heartstrings of people, not just the modern scientific mind. Now, for Pascal, reason struggles to or is unable to understand the nature or the mysteries of human existence, things such as injustice and death. So think about this. Reason has limits. It, it's not able to grasp these things. So in that sense, he, he recognizes that there is some truth to this idea that people have been too dogmatic with reason. They've let reason go too far. And what he's trying to understand here is that there are certain mysteries of human existence. And, you know, when we look at the concept of death, there's something where we understand it, but yet there's also an aspect of which we don't understand it. Or we see injustice and we understand that injustices occur. We may not always understand why they occur. There's a question, what could I have done differently? Or what could we have done differently? Or could society have done something differently? And that's because reason struggles to get at the very heart of these things. And sometimes it's unable to. And we see those differences. And that's a difference from Plato. You know, Plato would have said that, no, reason is the means by which we overcome these mysteries. A a knowledge of the forms is going to give you the proper interpretations of death and justice and injustice. Now, for Pascal, only a quasi or possibly non-rational religious faith, this is Pascal's kind of of wager, this bet, can deliver the hope of a true and deep happiness. In this sense, Pascal is a proto-existentialist due to his despair of reason and call for what existentialists later called a leap of faith. Now, one thing that we have to see is that Pascal was known for his wager. And the wager, which we're not going to fully get into here, is this idea that you're already in the game. You're already betting on whether or not God exists. And you need to make the right bet. And you're left with different options. Either God exists or he does not exist. And it's either true that God exists or it's false that God exists. Consequently, it's either true that God does not exist or it's false that God does not exist. In addition, we get into concepts of, and you believe it or not. So if God exists and it's true that God exists and you don't bet on him, well, what's the necessary reward? Well, it's going to be eternal loss. You know, for him as a Christian, you would suffer the penalty of your sins and you could spend an eternity in hell for that. But if God does not exist and you believe in him, what have you really lost? He's arguing that in this great wager, you are living a more moral life according to the dictates of society. You're living a a better life with your family. So there's real goods that can be given in a social sense and in a moral sense. So for him, if God doesn't exist and you believe in him, there's some good that can be with it. But as we continue to look through this, we could pan this out at a later date. The whole point of the wager is everybody's wagering whether or not God exists or whether it's true or not. And for him, the greatest bet to lose is that God exists and you don't believe in him. Whereas the greatest bet to win is that God exists and you actually believe in him. The other alternatives are happy mediums that are better than the extreme of God exists and you don't believe in him. All of that to say, his initial point is, is that this is a, a wager. This is not something that you're deducing through the traditional arguments for the existence of God. And that's why we say it's a quasi or possible non-rational religious faith. You're not using traditional arguments for the existence of God. You're not banking everything on divine revelation. It's a, a wager to deliver the hope of a true and deep happiness. It's a true leap of faith. It's a leap into one sense of a, of a darkness. It's not like reason is leading you onto this. Rather, you're taking a blind leap into the dark and you hope that you're getting right, but you have to jump, according to Pascal. And we could work that out in much more detail, but that's enough for now. But his point is, is that the biggest questions of life are embraced not by the new scientific reasoning, but by faith and love. Think about this. You're living in an era where people are saying all questions 
whether they be scientific questions or social questions or ethical questions, but in this sense, theological questions. Life's biggest questions about life and death, whether Jesus Christ is really the Son of God, whether he rose from the dead or not, whether justification by faith alone is true, or any of these other things, they're not known by this new scientific reasoning, but by faith and love. Now, there's one sense where he's right, and there's one sense in which he's wrong. Like we said, he's almost arguing for a non-rational faith, this, this idea that we can't go into it by means of reason. And in that sense, he's incorrect, because we're called to give a reason for the hope that we have. We don't have a non-cognitive, non-propositional view of revelation or a non-cognitive, non-propositional view of God. We have a cognitive. God, there's real content, truth content that can be put in real propositional form about God. Now, are there limits to reason? Yes. But in that, the idea of the relationship between faith and reason is that just because something's above our reason, meaning it's higher than our reason, doesn't mean that it's contrary to reason or it's irrational in and of itself. Now, what I want to do is give a plug. There's another video that I made specifically on Pascal where I deal with these things in full and I argue for the traditional classical apologetic for faith and reason. And I would encourage you to go and find that. Look in the channel and just type in Pascal and it will post there for you. Now, as we continue with Pascal, we see this idea of faith as a wager. For example, the big questions in life include who is God, who is man, what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of death? For him, these can only be answered in Jesus Christ by way of a non-rational faith. Now, this departs radically, like we said, from historic sort of ancient medieval and even you know, Reformed Christianity and even evangelical Christianity in that they all would have agreed that, yes, these answers can only be answered by a true faith in Jesus Christ, but it's not a non-rational faith. And that's because historically, we've understood that there are levels to the way in which faith operates. Faith is not something that's contrary to reason or anti-reason. It starts out, as Calvin would have said, with Notitia, which is knowledge in and of itself. There has to be some kind of content to the object of faith. There has to be something that really gives identity when we're talking about who is Jesus. In order for us to place our faith in Jesus, we have to know who Jesus is or who is God or what is this particular doctrine that we're teaching. And that's in the basic Notitia, the basic knowledge aspects. And then there's another level to how faith and reason operate, and that would be a sensus or a sense. So we not only believe that there is this, we rationally, but we assent unto it. We see it as something more than just cognitive knowledge. We say, say that this is something that I believe is actually true. But then there's a key distinction between notitia and a sensus, and that's what's known as fiducia. And fiducia is really this whole notion of faith in and of itself. Now, some people say fiducia or fiducia, um, and what we're arguing for here is, is that the, it's almost like building blocks. You have content with assent, and what's beyond assent? Well, it's faith. And this is precisely what James talks about. He talks about, well, the demons believe that there is a God, and yet they shudder. And what do the demons fundamentally lack? Well, they lack faith in God. And he's arguing that we don't want to have a demonic faith. We want to have faith that is contrary to a, a non-working form of Christianity. Faith, it's not just faith alone in the sense that we just have a blind leap or where our faith has real actions. And the real action for him is that the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, in this sense, brings about a changed life. But there is a real object of knowledge, which is the Noticia and the Ascensus brought into the Christian doctrine of who is Jesus Christ in these key questions. Now, for Pascal, imagination trumps reason, and justice trumps injustice, and death wins over life, and epistemological uncertainty can refute certainty. And what's of interest is, is that they're living in a dogmatic age where people are 
think unless I have absolute philosophical certainty about something, I just cannot believe it. And he's trying to say, well, we don't live like that in many areas of our life. We don't necessarily need certainty on something in order for us to be justified in the approach. Now, I'm not buying into this idea that certainty is impossible, nor am I denying the concept of certainty per se in and of itself. But the reality is, is that sometimes people do set the bar too high. And there can be a variety of reasons why people are not you know, repenting and placing faith, as he would say, in Jesus Christ. But his whole point is, is that we shouldn't allow a modern, quasi-scientific, materialistic definition of reason to be the sole, true, ultimate determination and definition of reason. And in that sense, we can have an element of uncertainty. But I think we can have certainty, and I think Christian apologists have proven that the Christian faith is not just the most morally certain thing, but it's the actual epistemologically certain thing. And I would really encourage you to go and read anything by key figures such as R.C. Sproul or Gerstner, another figure that shows that in the classic sense of the term that we can have epistemological certainty about the key things of the Christian faith. For him, meaning Pascal, love transcends reason and this famous quote, the heart, not just emotional sentiments, has its reasons which the reason does not know. And this whole quote I deal with at length in my whole lecture on Pascal. Now moving on, we're going to discuss Romanticism and Rousseau. Rousseau was an 18th century French philosopher and political thinker. And like Pascal, Rousseau was skeptical of modern reason. Unlike Pascal, Rousseau substituted reason with human feeling and emotions, not religious faith in divine revelation. So in many respects, they are trying to get away from dogmatic reason, and they do so in two different ways. Pascal does it with faith. Rousseau and the Romantics, the, the Romantist literature, they're going to do it with feelings and emotions. We truly determine that which is right based off of how we feel. But Pascal wasn't just one of faith. He was one of divine revelation. God is revealing these things to us. So what we're finding here is, is that there's in many respects, both in Rousseau and Pascal, a detraction thesis on the role of reason about the highest matters of life. In addition, for Rousseau, evil comes from the alienating structures of society, starting with private property. Note it does not come from ignorance nor from within human nature, which he grants to be innocent. So let's take it in reverse. For him, human nature in and of itself is innocent. We're born morally neutral in that regard. We're not bent towards evil. There's no concept of original sin. But evil for him is a reality. He's not denying the reality of evil. He's really denying the origin of evil from historic sources. You know, for Plato, evil would have been something from ignorance. The medievals would have said it was from something like original sin. All grant that the way we habituate children and raise children and structure society gives us evil, but he's giving us one where that's the absolute explanation for it. Like we said, evil comes from the alienating structures of society. But notice this, starting with private property. So the way that you fix it is you get rid of private property and private struggles in that regard, and you have to structure society in a way to get rid of evil. But the structured nature of society in and of itself is evil evil for him. In almost this sense, it's like a, an aspect of systemic evil in that regard. Now, Rousseau taught that man is by nature good and innocent, and that the villain is an artificial society that forces you to live contrary to one's nature and instinctive feeling. So when somebody forces you to live away and it doesn't allow true freedom of your emotions and true freedom of what you may find to be instinctive. Namely, it says laws will be enforced and you can't always do what you want. He says this is what causes people to fall into this, this evil and the, the nature and good of the innocent individual is corrupted. Now notice, Plato taught society overcame these issues. Rousseau taught society was the cause of the failure of these issues. Continuing on, 
Hobbes differed from Rousseau, remembering Hobbes from just a few minutes ago, and that he taught man is by nature evil and selfish, and only society could teach him to act justly. This must be an absolute monarchy. The Leviathan could force him to live justly. But both Hobbes and Rousseau oppose reason because they only accept Descartes' narrow definition of mathematical reason, not Plato's richer and fuller account of reason. So notice this. We see that they're both opposed to reason in, in a real sense of the term, meaning the platonic view of reason, because they both buy into Descartes' narrow definition. But there's also a distinction in that the way that they function that in society. Hobbes said, like he said, that man is the real reason why society is corrupt, whereas Rousseau is saying, no, society is the real reason man is corrupt. We see how the, the road or the line can be drawn in two different ways. Nonetheless, there's also a question of whether or not people from this era even understood reason as defined in the classic sense anymore. People started to narrowly focus on the modern definition of reason, and that that gives us something to consider. Does there come a point in which we've moved so far away from any definition of reason or a classic historical view that it's almost impossible for somebody to believe in it anymore? Now, it's interesting. I think there is some truth that there were probably figures that still studied Plato clearly, but in general, people were so tied down to this Cartesian understanding of reason that it just became the standard definition of reason. So I would encourage you to question your definition of reason. But we see this most prevalent today on the concept of God. You know, there was a time where it was impossible for people to not believe in God. The concept of God was so prevalent that it was just the this, this status quo. Modern philosophy gave rise, or rise to the notion that it is possible to not believe in God. And now today, you see figures where it's almost impossible for them to believe in God. The concept of God doesn't even make sense for them. And in a similar sense, almost the platonic definition of reason during that time held that role, and it most definitely does in our day and age. Now let's transition into another modern thinker, coming up our, our chart a different route, empiricism with Locke. John Locke was an 18th century English philosopher, best known as a key figure of modern empiricism. Remember, Aristotle was an empiricist, but now this is a new form of empiricism. And we have looked at the fact that rationalists taught that the mind had direct access to truth via innate ideas. Empiricists claim that reason is dependent upon sense experience. And this is one of the key differences. All of them agree that's with sense experience. But notice this, harder empiricists teach that reason is only the configuration of the senses and that abstract reason is not to be trusted. Rather, it is to be judged by sense experience. Here's the contrast. Soft empiricists, a la Aristotle, agrees that all knowledge begins with the senses, but he denies that it ends with the senses. Reason can abstract universal forms from matter, namely this notion of incarnate platonic forms. Modern empiricists deny Aristotle's approach because they are nominalists, and we discussed this with Occam. They are individuals who reduce universals, natures as such, to names rather than to objective realities. Moving on to immaterialism with Barclay. Barclay was an 18th century Irish philosopher. Hobbes and Barclay are two of the most opposed modern philosophers. It's interesting. Hobbes denied anything other than matter, whereas Barclay denied the existence of matter. He's a true immaterialist. Not only is everything all a matter of ideas, it's the, the, what you know are ideas and everything that exists are ideas. And if there is, happens to be a material world, you would only know it as an immaterial idea. But I think a good understanding of the history of philosophy would say that these two figures differed so much because they were absolutizing their position. Like we said, Hobbes denied anything other than matter and Barclay denied the existence of matter. Barclay is known as an idealist because he believes there is nothing except ideas and the minds that perceive them, whether divine or human mind. So we're a mind and we perceive ideas, but there's a great mind, the, 
the great mind is the divine mind. And Barclay was known to affirm this notion of SAS percipi, which is to be is to be perceived. So if something actually bees or it exists, it's because something is perceiving it. So something right now that you're looking at, the only reason that it exists, such as me, is because you are perceiving me. But what if you stopped perceiving me? What if you stopped looking at me and, and you continued on? Well, then I could cease to exist. But what happens when I continue to exist, even though you're not looking at me? Well, it's because there's a divine mind that continually, eternally continues to perceive things out in the material world or the immaterial world in his regard. For him, matter is nothing but God's ideas. The material world keeps existing even when we stop perceiving them because God never stops perceiving it, which is the notion of an idea. Immaterialism continued. Plato was a dualist who affirmed the immaterial, eternal ideas and material things. Hobbes denied the first half of the dualism. Anything beyond the cave, the world outside of the cave. Namely, Hobbes denied the immaterial world. Barclay denies the second half of the cave. Namely, the cave itself, the physical world. We just live in a world of ideas, immaterial ideas. And we'll finish here with David Hume, the Scottish skeptic that he's known. Hume is an 18th century philosopher who's considered the modern day father of modern day skepticism. Hume is considered to be the consistent empiricist who deduced the logical consequences of hard empiricism. He claims that we have no certain knowledge of things such as, except things such as relations of ideas and matters of fact. So matters of fact would be things directly perceived by you and relations of ideas would be analytic truths like one plus one is two or all bachelors are unmarried men. If it's not something of those two areas, then you don't have certain knowledge. But if you don't have certain knowledge, you could be wrong. These contingent truths could be contrary to whatever we're claiming them to be. And for that, we need to be skeptical of them because there's nothing rationally binding them to mandate that they must be true. For him, as we said, relations of ideas are contentless tautologies, such as X is X or analytic truths. Matters of fact are always contingent and sometimes never certain. This is where we get into the key distinctions. We do not have certainty for him that things such as the sun will rise tomorrow because they're contingent truths. This is one of the key points. The past does not prove the future, and the only reason we believe the sun will rise tomorrow is because of customary conjunction. The only reason you believe the sun's going to rise tomorrow is not because laws of science, those are contingent truths, or because you know it in and of itself because tomorrow doesn't exist. The only reason you know is because it's happened every day in the past, but there's nothing rationally binding to say that it's going to happen tomorrow. You don't see the necessary rational connective causes to necessarily rationally and sufficiently determine or require that to occur. It's by customary conjunction. You only believe it because it's happened before. And you only believe it because somebody told you it's going to happen again, or you believe that it's going to happen again. Knowledge of reality for him is strictly limited to the sense experience, and the senses can only tell you what is currently happening, not what will necessarily happen, namely causality. For Hume, there are no platonic ideas or Aristotelian forms. He's a radical nominalist, and as far as one can be from Plato's ideas, and I want to finish with one of these, these illustrations with them about billiards, pool, and he says, this notion of causality and customary conjunctions is his classic example. You see a person hit a billiard ball and it hits another ball. And somebody's going to say, the first ball is the cause of the second ball. And he's going to say, well, show me, show me empirically the cause. You see one event followed by another event. You see one ball come into another one, but where's this causality occur? You're going to say you don't see it. You don't see causality in and of itself. There's nothing within the passive sense experience that gives you this non-sensual causality. You just see things occurring. So for him, you need to be skeptical of these types of things and of these notions of causality in that regard. And not only just of causality, but of anything that's not 
an analytic truth or a specific immediate matter of fact. And that's because for Hume, he's going to argue that they're not directly known with sense experience. Now, the question is whether or not this is a consistent way of living one's life. And Hume would even argue things like, oh, I never denied such a thing as a cause, but he couldn't consistently live this lifestyle. He still had to go out and play backgammon and different games in order to get out of the, the perils of this philosophical world view. So by way of reminder, what we've done is we've looked at many of the rationalists. We've looked at Descartes and Spinoza and Plato. We're not going to look at Leibniz from this chart. And he's definitely a key figure. He's definitely a key footnote, but not for this series. We've looked at empiricism coming from figures such as Aristotle or Locke or Barclay or even Hume. And what I want you to see here is, is that when you see Hume, you see the advent of radical skepticism. Now, it all comes together in Immanuel Kant, who's going to try to synthesize rationalism and empiricism into his synthetic a priori. And we'll break that down at another lecture. But what I want you to see here is, is that ideas have consequences. And we need to understand them in their fullest sense of the term, because if ideas have consequences and they have origins, they readily affect your life. And I would encourage you after this to not study simplistic TV shows or different ways where these are being discussed. Take a classical approach to it. Study the great books of human history, of the world, of the Western world that bring these out into great, great detail and in a fuller sense because they're trying to deal with the dialogues at their greatest level. It's not at a superficial level. And it's one of those things where if you can ask the hardest question and deal with the hardest questions in the history of philosophy, you can deal with the lesser questions. And if you can deal with the issues in their fullest sense by reading the original literature, whether it be the original philosophical literature or even as it's put into other forms of literature, whether it be books and novels and so forth, you're going to be readily equipped to deal with them in the proper way. In many respects, that's what a classical education attempts to do. And that's why I think we should read the classics, because you're going to see things in books like Homer's Iliad, or you're going to see the classical literature coming from the ancients and the medievals that deal with all of the major issues that we're dealing with today, but just to be absolutely honest, better. So as we continue on, we're going to switch and transition into another era of modern philosophy, starting with agnosticism and Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm.